Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today we're going to talk about near-death experiences. It is a a wonderful and uncanny category of reported human experience. Jung had a life-changing near-death experience. He writes about it extensively. I've come across friends and a few analysands, particularly those who have been in active duty military, who have had near-death experiences, it seems that there is something remarkable that happens in both the body and in the psyche when we are between the worlds, so to speak. Mm. Researchers, some of which are in the University of Virginia, actually find there are some similarities between near-death experiences, and they're trying to understand what What is this all about? And we're going to try to do the same today. Yeah, so apparently about 10 to 20% of people who have a uh, a situation in which they're near death and then come back from it report these experiences. And so I think we'll, we'll start with just a very basic definition. I'm pulling this definition from the Near Death Experience Research Foundation website, which uh, is a wonderful resource, and uh, that is nderf.org, and we'll put that in the show notes too. And they define it in this way, a lucid experience associated with perceived consciousness apart from the body occurring at the time of actual or threatened imminent death. So, interestingly enough, some people claim that they suddenly find themselves outside of their bodies, and sometimes they're in an extraordinary inner world where they encounter figures of light that speak to them, that are understandable to them. Other people say that they actually transcend the physical body, but they stay in the same location, and they're able to move outside of, let's say, the emergency Uh services room into a hallway, into another room, hear and remember conversations, check on loved ones far away, and retain a memory of what they saw, and then verify that what they saw, in fact, was correct. Yeah. Uh, this um, research foundation has been scrupulous in, in being able to verify uh, reports of out-of-body experience uh, when people are fully anesthetized, for example, in an operating room, and uh, there should not be any uh, physiological way that these experiences can happen. Uh, so these experiences, uh, near-death experience and out-of-body experience, which are uh, a little different, actually, um, have a lot of accounts. A lot of people attest to this. There's a lot of data on it. Um, and uh, that's what we're here to talk about today, as it, do- it doesn't stand up to reason. And yet, there it is. Yeah. So it's it's been re- it's a phenomenon that was first identified in uh, I think the seventies. Joseph, is that right? With Raymond Moody's yes. research, mm-hmm. and I think mm-hmm. identified particularly in the Western uh, mm-hmm. world. I think it had been discussed in other cultures previously. Right. 
And the interesting thing about it is that uh, researchers that have looked at these have noted that there are commonalities across cultures. And mm-hmm. there's some there's some basic features that many of them have. So many of them have an experience of um, kind of rapid movement through space. It might just be kind of rapid movement across a landscape. And in the West, there's often a, an experience of moving, moving rapidly through a tunnel. Uh, but but in, in other cultures, it, it might be rapid movement uh, over a landscape, for example. Uh, and then another common experience is um, the, the experience of uh, meeting dead relatives. Mm-hmm. And most of the people that you meet in an NDE apparently are deceased, although not all of the time, but something I think like 90% of the time, including people have had near-death experiences in which they met a deceased relative and they didn't know the person had died. Mm. So that they met, they met someone who was so recently yeah. deceased that they didn't even, they had no uh, conscious knowledge that the person had passed. Um, so again, that's very common throughout, uh, throughout these experiences kind of cross-culturally. And I think another one that's common is the experience of, um, of, a, of, a, of a, a light, if I'm not mistaken. That's another common one. Uh-huh. Yes, and, and often the light is taken for some proxy for God. Mm-hmm. That it seems to be not just a light, but the light. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and then the other interesting, you know, there are some ways that culture or individual stuff shapes these. So uh, although there are these universal components, there are these, you know, kind of cultural differences in the way, you know, so for, for some people see Jesus, for example, and in a different cultural context, you might see something else, but, but they do have these core commonalities and, uh, you know, um, some include the out-of-body experience that that you guys were both talking about, although not all of them, but there are these in which, you know, the the person reports, I was, I was above my body watching you Mm -hmm. try to get my heart restarted. And, you know, Joseph, as you alluded, there are some cases where, uh, what they saw has been corroborated. I read about one case where, um, the, the man was, you know, up at the ceiling in the, ER or wherever he was being operated on. And he saw on top of an eight foot cabinet, there was a quarter and he saw that it was a quarter from 1985 (laughs) and he reported that and they went and they got a ladder and they climbed up and they got the quarter and it was from 1985. So, and there's a, I mean, there's a a number of these that have been, you know, corroborated and it's quite extraordinary. Um, So uh, this is a fascinating area. And, of course, one of the other important things to look at is what they call after effects, mm-hmm. which is how people change after these. Not everyone reports big changes, but the majority of people report substantial changes, including the number one change is they lose their fear of death. Yes. And, uh, and other changes, people become more compassionate, more curious. A lot of people leave organized religion, not all of them, but some of them do because they they feel that organized religion is too constrained and doesn't accurately convey what they feel they now know. So they become more spiritual, but maybe less religious. So, You know, I'm uh, thinking about how this concern with mortality is so very, very deeply human. You know, is there life after death? And going back to the ancient rites in Greece, of the ritual of uh, Eleusis, which lasted for a thousand years, mm. and that that what there was a year's worth at least of preparation for this ceremony, and anyone uh, could partake as long as he or she spoke Greek, mm. uh, whether a noble woman or a nobleman or a slave. And uh, that this is exactly the outcome from this special ritual where people walked the 13 miles from Athens to Eleusis and were, uh, you know, there was a a trance-like state induced. There may have been uh, some sort of hallucinogenic Mm. component to this. 
in addition to the year's worth of, of spiritual preparation. So uh, this was the outcome also of people lost their fear of death. Hmm. And uh, so I just want to, you know, these are experiences, near-death experiences and ritual experiences that, that give us, can give us the reassurance that there is something more. Well, and related to that too, Deb, I'm thinking about the episode we did somewhat recently on psychedelics because mm -hmm. psychedelic experiences also sometimes yes. uh, alleviate an intense fear of death. So, some, yeah. so whenever we, we have this experience, a, a kind of an intimation, like you said, that there's something more, it's very reassuring. And how fascinating that this can occur in this particular fashion on the threshold of biological death. And of course, I'm assuming that NDEs are more common now and more commonly reported because probably there are greater number, numbers of people who can become resuscitated with modern medical procedures. Ah, but I mm -hmm. imagine there's, I imagine this has always been part of the human experience and that uh, these experiences have informed our understanding of uh, the afterlife and uh, you know what what we what we think we know about religion and that kind of thing. So I think this Re is a central part. Relative to researchers is also this enormous question of consciousness not being right. contained exclusively in the body. That the brain may be something of the machinery hmm. of how consciousness interacts with the physical body but that consciousness itself may transcend the brain and right. be able to function without the body. And wow. for a number of scientific researchers, that, that's the question that they're asking. What is consciousness? What's required for consciousness? Yeah. And what and, uh, near-death experiences are, are bringing to the forefront is at least anecdotal evidence Mm -hmm. that consciousness is not limited to the physical body. Yeah. Uh, which I think your story, Lisa, really illustrates very, very well of uh, the man who had an out-of-body experience and, and could report that there was a quarter lying way up on top of a cabinet. So there, there are many um, experiences of this type that are, are verified. Mm-hmm. And call into question just what you're talking about, Joseph, of is our being, our consciousness, our sense of self uh, limited to physiology? And this is often, I think, connected to why people no longer have the fear of death, because for many who have a rather materialistic viewpoint, the concern is that when the body dies, my personality, my consciousness will cease to exist. There is simply a void. Mm. So the near-death experiences suggest, again anecdotally, that that is not true and that consciousness is not dependent on the body. And when that's an, a lived experience and not just mm -hmm. a theoretical experience, mm -hmm. that's what seems to give people the confidence that the death of the body is not the end. You know, for most people that have a near-death experience, too, it's incredibly, like, blissful. It's, you know, realer than real, and it's so, uh, you know, they, they see things. They, some some near-death experiences uh, have been reported among those people who have been blind from birth. Mm -hmm. And then they, they suddenly have vision and can see things. And... So, so they're rapturous, many of them, although there, there, is, there, is a, there are small numbers of reports of people having really unpleasant near-death experiences. I imagine that those are talked about less, but they are out there. But, but I think it, it, so it's not only, it's, it's, you know, a lot of people report, and we'll see this in Jung's report too, it's like, you know, it's, they're told, we hear this story of, you're told it's not time, you have to go back. And often there's a sense of like, no, mm. I don't want to go back. Yeah. Don't make me go back. And that happened to Jung. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a near-death experience and he was very angry at his doctor for, for bringing him back. Uh, he really protested uh, having to return. 
You know, I think I think one of the Jungian concepts we're dancing around here is this notion that uh, Jung called the relativization of the ego. And it, it's it's a sort of a big term that basically means that we have an experience that lets us know that our ego is only a tiny part of us. Uh-huh. So it's often in relationship to the self. But, uh, you know, and we can have this relativization of the ego in many ways. We can have it just because we have a big ego plan that fails. Uh-huh. And that's like, oh, I guess not everything, yeah. you know, I can't always have my way. But something like this is uh, kind of next level. It, it's, it's a real, you know, Jung said that it's the approach to the numinous that heals. And a lot of these entities yes. are incredibly numinous. Yes, and and so it would be that experience of coming back and really knowing in a very visceral way that your ego is not all there is. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's just go back and say for listeners what you mean by the self, which is what Jung called that transpersonal, transcendent, a reality that is uh, often imaged in religions as uh, a divine figure, the, the Buddha, uh, the Christ, uh, various other kinds of images, so that we have a way of envisioning it. But uh, it is that which is not I. And because this is archetypal, uh, it has a dark side as well as a light side. So when you said, Lisa, that sometimes there are experiences that are really uh, difficult for people, um, that that too is part of the self. uh, And we're called upon in life, not only uh, through near-death experiences, to encounter that. Yeah, that's great framing, Deb. I I think, you know, if you read some of these negative... uh, these negative reports, or even if yeah. you look at, you know, some people have negative experiences with psilocybin or other psychedelics. Exactly. It's like, oh yeah, there's the dark side of the self, right? It's yeah, it's going, it's going to kind of pick you up and chew you up and spit you out. Uh, and so those experiences, I mean, we are called upon to be able to stand against that, to be able to hold on to a sense of self. Uh, in, in the face of something that is greater, which is, you know, in a way, exactly what happened to Job. Yeah. When he finally, you know, goes out and says, you know, all these things have happened to me. And he demands of Yahweh, you know, sort of, in effect, demanding an explanation. I was a good person and I did everything I was supposed to do. And what is all this about? And uh, the answer basically, uh, you know, the words are, you know, where were you when I created the, the mm-hmm. heavens and the earth? I'm paraphrasing. But uh, that it is simply the recognition of something greater yeah. that um, in that moment appears in its dark and uncaring aspect. And Job has enough integrity as a personality, as a human, uh, to, be, to be able to stand in that and stand against it and not be swept away by it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's really important is what do we do as individuals in the face of something greater? And it's wonderful when it's benign and magical and sweeps us away, you know, and I'm thinking about, um, you know, our podcast and what's out there in the culture with um, mind-altering substances. But uh, in the meantime, we have our lives to live, making us have enough wholeness, enough integrity, enough sense of self to have that while we are having other experiences, mm-hmm. including near-death experiences. And I think that one of the signs that the ego has been properly relativized is that somebody has access to reverence. <laughs> oh, oh, that's perfect. Yeah, that's great. That's ex- that, that feels so spot on. Thank you for that. Yeah. Because it, it, it's Joseph, I, I'm so glad you said that because there are people who lack that and I, I can feel how... Um, Irreverent. 
<laughs> yeah, but but just that that that, that there's a kind of psycho spiritual sickness that goes yeah. along with that inability to feel reverence and awe. Yeah. You know, yes, mm-hmm. it's like those are those are some of the most important things to be able to feel. So yeah. so thank you for that. Yeah, and that is what Job experienced also. So light or dark, reverence is important, and of course, um, the prereq, so to speak is developing um, a a strong, flexible, well-adapted ego that is able to remain present for the other, for these experiences. So I think we're leaning into that question of how might these experiences change someone? Mm -hmm. And so as you were saying, Lisa, that the theology or doxology that they have inherited from the religions of their childhood don't include enough of their experiential dimensions. And so then they begin to seek, but also self-define these inner spiritual worlds and, in a sense, create their own paradigm around that, which goes to something that Jung wrote about in terms of what is religion. Mm-hmm. And, and how can we understand religious organizations? Often what occurs is that an extraordinary person, which in the Catholic tradition we might call a saint, has a profound internal spiritual experience and then is able to communicate that to others in such a compelling way that huh. they too seek, often through um, imitation, a way to cultivate a similar experience. Mm -hmm. So even though it may seem strange to say that somebody has a near-death experience and in a way Mm. they have formed or are forming their own religion around Mm -hmm. that, that that actually is how religion in terms of technique and theology in fact has already occurred. Yes, Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's... Yeah, you know, there's this stuff about after effects is is really uh, quite interesting. But w- one of the things, Joseph, that I think relates to what you're talking about is how people are responded to when they first confide. Mm-hmm. So if the first confiding experience is, oh, that's crazy, or what's wrong with you, or even, oh my gosh, that's evil, because it doesn't match with maybe your religious beliefs or something, it can be very difficult for the person to integrate the experience. But if the first confiding is met with, you know, interest and curiosity and kind of affirming, you know, uh, then, then, then the person has an easier time integrating yeah. it. But just, uh, you know, just as you're saying, I think, it, you know, there's this thing that sort of shatters your understanding of what might be. And then you have to come back and make sense of it. And I imagine. Uh-huh that you're, you're absolutely right. My guess is that um, people who have experienced NDEs throughout history have come back and made sense of it by uh, kind of re- either knitting it into an existing theology or even creating a new theology uh-huh. because we have to have a way of trying to understand this. Uh, you know, I just want to say, I was talking about the common elements. I knew I forgot something. Life review is a common element. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm back on, you know, your concept of the relativization of the ego, of that we do need to make meaning out of it. And yet these experiences will never fit into the narrow confines of our embodied uh, day-to-day uh, experience, uh, ego is just too small mm-hmm. to really be able to render this. But, so we tell, there are stories. People tell what they experience. Um, there are stories in religious texts of transcendent experiences that may not be near-death experience, but, you know, something like Moses and his vision of the burning bush on the mountain. Um, you know, was it it certainly was not a literal burning bush. Uh, and, and so there are so many experiences that are beyond ego, beyond our ability to really confine 
uh, in terms of our sensory experience or in terms of, of quote, science, unquote. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't, it, there's no chemical formula for this. And as you were saying, the struggle to find a way to embody, to language, to imagine the experience is necessary for the ego to be able to metabolize it. Mm -hmm. This is the same struggle we have with remembering our dreams, mm -hmm. that we have some kind of non-ordinary experience in a dream state, mm -hmm. and if we can't find language to contain it or to bridge our ego experience to the extraordinary experience, it's more likely that we will oh. forget it, that it yeah, will, it will yeah. slip out of our hands. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people that have had near-death experiences do launch on a campaign to find language. Does Tibetan mm -hmm. Buddhism talk about this? Do the ancient Greeks talk about it? Is there something in the mystical dimension of mm -hmm. uh, Catholicism or, or Islam that can give me poetry, language, images to try mm -hmm. to hold on yeah. to the experience? Because that holding on allows it to become part of the structure of the personality. Mm -hmm. Gives you a way to think about it. Yeah. I, but I really like uh, what you said, Joseph, of non-ordinary experience as an umbrella term for near-death experience, out-of-body experience, and dreams, that everybody has dreams, and they are non-ordinary experiences. And there are lots of experiences uh, that religious figures have reported. Um, uh, Muhammad. Uh, received uh, the, the Quran uh, from an angel and uh, had it written down word for word. So there, there are so many non-ordinary kinds of experience that we do translate into language, a religious text or relating the experience, uh, capturing some uh, aspect of the experience in ritual. Uh, so, so as to make it more accessible to the conscious mind and, and to others. You, you know, it feels like what we're backing into is this relationship between near-death experiences and what Jung called the religious function of the psyche. Mm -hmm. And what he meant by that is that we're, we're, we're kind of wired to relate to the transpersonal. Mm -hmm. and. And Jung, you know, in a lot of his early writings, he stopped short of saying, well, the transpersonal exists. But what he says is we certainly have a function in the psyche that is designed to relate to it. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, this is, this is, a, this is a little different where we're the entry point that we're, we're, we're here today. But we're, we are wondering about how the psyche relates to this, you know, kind of transcendent, uh, supranormal experience. And, and then what do we do with that on a psychological, personal level and even on a cultural level? Uh, and I, I think, you know, in our culture, there is a real tendency to, to distance and uh, maybe even demean these kinds of experiences. There is a lot of interest uh, in them, but they also, you know, it, it tends to kind of feel like a bit of a fringe research area, I think. You know, what, what, it, what are we talking about here? Because, <laughs> because some of what is found, the implications really go against a kind of material scientific view of like you, what you were saying, Joseph, of what consciousness is. And this goes to also the great tension between Freud and Jung, that Freud had a very concrete, worldly view of what psychological health would mean, that the quote-unquote fantasies that Jung was reporting would have been analyzed in such a way that they would have been dismissed as some kind of an avoidance of reality, mm -hmm. and that we should be keeping our feet on the ground, our eyes should be in this horizontal plane, and that, that's where the adaptive good stuff for the ego lives. Mm -hmm. And Jung was having uh, extraordinary experiences, even in childhood, through the mediumistic uh -huh. spiritualist community around him, 
but also his own rich inner life that was also uncanny mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. not like what other people were saying. So the whole birth of Jungian psychology comes from this interest and validation of the extraordinary experiences mm. that human beings have had and continue to have. Yeah. So, and, and yeah, and there it is, you know, whether, whether we like it or we don't like it, whether it fits into uh, our Western cultural paradigm of science and reality and all of our inheritance from the Enlightenment or not, uh, there it is. And other times and other cultures have valued these experiences much more, such as uh, the ritual from ancient Greece that I mentioned of the, the rites of, uh, at Eleusis or Eleusis. Uh, and there's something in today's culture that resists this, despite um, the painstaking uh, recording and validation and so on uh, done by uh, the, the NDE Research Foundation. And also, in the shamanic traditions, often what marked someone as a shaman mm -hmm. is that they seem to have died and ah, come back. And when right. they came back, they also retained an access to that other world. Ah. And perhaps somewhere else in, in our talk today, we can discuss the fact that many people come back and they have what people would say are extraordinary psychic abilities yes. and sensitivities yes. that they did not have before. And I have a number of thoughts about that. Right. Uh, yeah, because that is one of the reported after effects that people um, mm. have clairvoyance or other kind of uh, parapsychological experiences. Mm -hmm. So we could posit that in addition to the, the well-recorded five senses, we mm -hmm. also have um, an ability or capability for psychic experience, psychic receptivity, um, and heaven knows that has been reported and recorded throughout time. Mm -hmm. In the Western mystery tradition, they refer to it as the awakening of the inner sensorum. Hmm. We have outer senses and we have inner senses. And whether it's through tragedy, like a near-death experience, or through rigorous techniques, that we can begin to cultivate this inner sensorum and then become aware of these inner worlds. Hmm. But I think, Lisa, you were, you were going to um, bring yeah. something. Yeah, let's, let's dive into Jung's experience, if that's okay. So this is um, from Memories, Dreams, Reflections, his autobiography, and it's a little bit of a long passage, but it's really fascinating. So uh, Jung was 68 years old in, in, uh, during the time that he's recording here. At the beginning of 1944, I broke my foot, and this misadventure was followed by a heart attack. In a state of unconsciousness, I experienced deliriums and visions, which must have begun when I hung on the edge of death and was being given oxygen and camphor injections. The images were so tremendous that I myself concluded that I was close to death. My nurse afterward told me, it was as if you were surrounded by a bright glow, that was a phenomenon she had sometimes observed in the dying, she added. I had reached the outermost limit and do not know whether I was in a dream or an ecstasy. At any rate, extremely strange things began to happen to me. It seemed to me that I was high up in space. Far below, I saw the globe of the earth bathed in a gloriously blue light. I saw the deep blue sea in the continents. Far below my feet, lay Ceylon, and in the distance ahead of me, the subcontinent of India. My field of vision did not include the whole earth, but its global shape was plainly distinguishable, and its outlines shone with a silvery gleam through that wonderful blue light. In many places, the globe seemed colored or spotted dark green, like oxidized silver. Far away to the left lay a broad expanse, the reddish-yellow desert of Arabia, it was as though the silver of the earth had there assumed a reddish gold hue. Then came the Red Sea, and far, far back, as in the upper left of a map, I could just make out a bit of the Mediterranean. My gaze was directed chiefly toward that. Everything else appeared indistinct. 
I could also see the snow-covered Himalayas, but in that direction it was foggy or cloudy. I did not look to the right at all. I knew that I was on the point of departing from the earth. Later I discovered how high in space one would have to be to have so extensive a view, approximately a thousand miles. The sight of the earth from this height was the most glorious thing I had ever seen. After contemplating it for a while, I turned around. I had been standing with my back to the Indian Ocean, as it were, and my face to the north. Then it seemed to me that I made a turn to the south. Something new entered my field of vision. A short distance away, I saw in space a tremendous dark block of stone like a meteorite. It was about the size of my house or even bigger. It was floating in space and I myself was floating in space. I had seen similar stones on the coast of the Gulf of Bengal. They were blocks of tawny granite, and some of them had been hollowed out into temples. My stone was one such gigantic dark block. An entrance led into a small antechamber. To the right of the entrance, a Hindu sat silently in lotus posture upon a stone bench. He wore a white gown, and I knew that he expected me. Two steps led up to his antechamber, and inside on the left was the gate to the temple. Innumerable tiny niches, each with a saucer-like concavity filled with coconut oil and small burning wicks, surrounded the door with a wreath of bright flames. I had once actually seen this when I visited the Temple of the Holy Tooth at Candy in Ceylon. The gate had been framed by several rows of burning oil lamps of this sort. As I approached the steps leading up to the entrance into the rock, a strange thing happened. I had the feeling that everything was being sloughed away. Everything I aimed at or wished for or thought, the whole phantasmagoria of earthly existence fell away or was stripped from me, an extremely painful process. Nevertheless, something remained. It was as if I now carried along with me everything I had ever experienced or done, everything that had happened around me. I might also say it was with me and I was it. I consisted of all that, so to speak. I consisted of my own history, and I felt with great certainty, this is what I am. I am this bundle of what has been and what has been accomplished. This experience gave me a feeling of extreme poverty, but at the same time of great fullness. There was no longer anything I wanted or desired. I existed in an objective form. I was what I had been and lived. At first, the sense of annihilation predominated, of having been stripped or pillaged, but suddenly that became of no consequence. Everything seemed to be past. What remained was a fait accompli without any reference back to what had been. There was no longer any regret that something had dropped away or been taken away. On the contrary, I had everything that I was, and that was everything. Something else engaged my attention. As I approached the temple, I had the certainty that I was about to enter an illuminated room and would meet there all those people to whom I belong in reality. There I would at last understand, this too was a certainty, what historical nexus I or my life fitted into. I would know what had been before me, why I had come into being, and where my life was flowing. My life as I lived it had often seemed to me like a story that has no beginning and no end. I had the feeling that I was a historical fragment, an excerpt for which the preceding and succeeding text was missing. My life seemed to have been snipped out of a long chain of events, and many questions had remained unanswered. Why had I taken this course? Why had I brought these particular assumptions with me? What had I made of them? What will follow? I felt sure that I would receive an answer to all these questions as soon as I entered the rock temple. There I would learn why everything had been thus and not otherwise. There I would meet the people who knew the answer to my question about what had been before and what would come after. While I was thinking over these matters, something happened that caught my attention. From below, from the direction of Europe, an image floated up. It was my doctor, Dr. H, or rather his likeness framed by a golden chain or a golden laurel wreath. I knew at once, aha, this is my doctor, of course, the one who has been treating me. But now he is coming in his primal form as a basileus of Kos. 
In life, he had been an avatar of this Basileus, this temporal embodiment of the primal form, which has existed from the beginning. Now he is appearing in that primal form. Presumably, I too was in my primal form, though this was something I did not observe, but simply took for granted. As he stood before me, a mute exchange of thought took place between us. Dr. H. had been delegated by the earth to deliver a message to me, to tell me there was a protest against my going away. I had no right to leave the earth and must return. The moment I heard that, the vision ceased. I was profoundly disappointed, for now it all seemed to have been for nothing. The painful process of defoliation had been in vain, and I was not allowed to enter the temple to join the people in whose company I belonged. In reality, a good three weeks were still to pass before I could truly make up my mind to live again. I could not eat because all food repelled me. The view of city and mountains from my sick bed seemed to me like a painted curtain with black holes in it or a tattered sheet of newspaper full of photographs that meant nothing. Disappointed, I thought, now I must return to the box system again. For it seemed to me as if behind the horizon of the cosmos, a three-dimensional world had been artificially built up in which each person sat by himself in a little box. And now I should have to convince myself all over again that this was important. Life and the whole world struck me as a prison, and it bothered me beyond measure that I should again be finding all that quite in order. I had been so glad to shed it all, and now it had come about that I, along with everyone else, would again be hung up in a box by a thread. While I had floated in space, I had been weightless, and there had been nothing tugging at me. And now all that was being was to be a thing of the past. I felt violent resistance to my doctor because he had brought me back to life at the same time I was worried about him. His life is in danger, for heaven's sakes. He has appeared to me in his primal form. When anybody attains this form, it means he's going to die, for already he belongs to the greater company. Suddenly, the terrifying thought came to me that Dr. H. would have to die in my stead. I tried my best to talk to him about it, but he did not understand me. Then I became angry with him. Why does he always pretend he doesn't know he is a Basileus of Kos, <laughs> and that he had already assumed his primal form? He wants to make me believe that he doesn't know. That irritated me. My wife reproved me for being so unfriendly to him. She was right. But at the time, I was angry with him for stubbornly refusing to speak of all that had passed between us in my vision. Damn it all, he ought to watch his step. He has no right to be so reckless. I want to tell him to take care of himself. I was firmly convinced that his life was in jeopardy. In actual fact, I was his last patient. On April 4th, 1944, I still remember the exact date, I was allowed to sit up on the edge of my bed for the first time since the beginning of my illness, and on this same day, Dr. H. took to his bed and did not leave it again. I heard that he was having intermittent attacks of fever. Soon afterward, he died of septicemia. He was a good doctor. There was something of the genius about him. Otherwise, he would not have appeared to me as a prince of Kos. Oh. Mm. I mean, I mean, when Jung has a near-death experience, he really, he really just, you know, <laughs> pulls out all the stops. Lisa, where is that in the in the works? In case people want to find it again, it's um, it's memories, dreams, reflections, and it's right at the beginning of the chapter called visions, which in my book begins on page two eighty nine. <laughs> So there are several things in his near-death experience that we also see in the growing body of literature. Mm -hmm. One is that being free of the under-functioning brain and the distraction of illness, consciousness is much clearer that the ability to remember, the ability to experience, the ability to think and to make sense mm -hmm. is far superior to what it was when we were kind of trapped in our troubled 
mm-hmm. flesh, or what some mystics call the pelt. The pelt. <laughs> <laughs> Wearing this pelt until we take it off. The other thing that you had mentioned earlier is Jung had that experience of not wanting to return, that there was mm-hmm. so much promise for him. Yeah. And for Jung particularly, we can find in his writings and in memories, dreams, and reflection a lifelong lament of not feeling understood. Yes. And, and here was at least a felt sense that he was right on the verge of finding his people, people that he had enough connection to that he could be known and know. Mm-hmm. And how much he longed for that. And of course, we all long for that. But for oh. Jung, it was a place of just tremendous suffering. You know, as I was reading that part, I was having this thought. I mean, you know, like someday we'll do an episode about Jung the person. Um, <laughs> but, but he was a really unusual person. And, you know, there's sort of like, who would you want to have dinner with? I don't know that I would ever want to meet Jung. I think. It would just be too freaking intimidating because he was so, uh, like, just beyond brilliant, right? And I, I, it's not like I think the guy is a saint, but there, there, there was this, like, I, I think I have the same question, like, where did he come from? Who was he that he came yeah. down to this earth and just kind of was able to access all of this stuff? And so, so I can see why he wanted to get into that temple and figure out <laughs> What was this all about? <laughs> I don't think I'm going to have that experience when I pass. <laughs> I'm rather more ordinary. But uh, yeah, it, it's a mystery. He's a bit of a mystery, and he must have been a bit of a mystery to himself. Yeah. Uh, what I'm aware of here is the image-making uh, function of, of the psyche, of this capacity that we have that Jung had uh, far, far more than most of us to experience the depths, to experience mm-hmm. another, another realm. And, uh, you know, that I could imagine that, you know, there might be, you know, people out there that say, well, um, you know, that that's not really true. I mean, he entered a meteorite that was, it was his meteorite and there's a guru <laughs> sitting there and, <laughs> Um, you know, that, that doesn't sound right. And that, that, that's exactly what happens with, uh, these kinds of experiences when we, when we want to bring them back into, um, down to earth, uh, and, um, our pelt covered selves. Mm-hmm. I love, I love that idea, Joseph, uh, that, <laughs> that, that it, those experiences don't translate in, in such a concrete, literal sense to our waking life experience uh, on earth. And that makes them easier to discount of, mm-hmm. uh, for people that say, well, then um, wouldn't everybody experience it that way? You know, what, why doesn't everybody report entering a meteorite? Uh, so there's something about the, the rupture between Consciousness, ego, waking life, and these kinds of experiences uh, that make them tantalizing and yet uh, difficult to to really integrate Mm -hmm. into our known reality. You know, one of the things I find fascinating about Jung's vision, and and I didn't clock this until I started looking at this for this episode, but he he gives a very detailed description of what the earth looked like from a thousand feet in the air. And now, you know, (laughs) we read that and we're like, oh yeah, we've all seen the pictures, right? But the first picture of earth from space, the first one that was sort of like had the, I'm just looking it up, um, like the first photograph of earth as a whole, which it it is surrounded by that kind of silver blue light. Um, That, the first one was 1972. There were earlier ones. The earliest one was from 1946, but it's very rough and grainy and just, you know, kind of, but that was still, this was still two years before that. So Mm. Jung was, and and even, even that sense of like, oh, the snow capped mountains and the way the desert looks 
kind of reddish gold. I mean, I think that these are, these are, you know, that, that's the way it looks. And here, here Jung had access to that somehow, which uh-huh. I mean, maybe, I mean, that's just what, what one would have imagined, but it's, it's tantalizing. So let's lean a little bit into some of the kind of occult and mystical thinking about the relationship between near-death experiences and the various techniques that religious and spiritual traditions have used to try to step into this other world without the trauma of a near-death experience. One of the things that modern occultists are very curious about is the role of carbon dioxide in changing brain function permanently. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting thing that pranayama, which is a control of breath, has a number of miraculous kind of benefits, but particularly can induce very powerful altered states of consciousness. And there is a claim that certain spiritual capacities can be awakened through a disciplined use of breath control. One of the primary tools of pranayama is training the body to slow down the breathing process. For instance, there's a technique just called a four count of breath to breathe in over four seconds, to hold the breath for four seconds, to exhale for four seconds, and hold the breath out for four seconds. There's a number of benefits to that regulating process, but in the yogic traditions, one would seek to expand that time frame so that one could do that same pattern for 30 seconds, for instance. And this ability to tolerate oxygen deprivation through these disciplines also seems to change certain brain functions and perhaps even brain structures, similar to what happens when people are in near-death experiences, but not anywhere nearly as severely. So there is a certain mystery about that sustained CO2 level that seems to change how the brain perceives the phenomena that it can access. The second thing that I think is very interesting from this mystical tradition is that near-death experiences and how they change people are very similar to kundalini experiences and how people say that they are also changed. What, What is often not discussed but is an idea reserved often for initiates, is that in the final moments of death, the kundalini energy is liberated from the sacrum, rises up the spine as it does for adepts. And as the kundalini reaches beyond the body and connects to those transpersonal centers, the soul is escorted out of the body and into the larger world of consciousness. This is often why those who have had near-death experiences also describe a kind of ecstasy. And those who work in environments where people are observed dying, the dying also seem to have something of an ecstatic experience as they are transitioning out of the body. And any of you, like myself, who have done a lot of work with kundalini work, also when the kundalini rises, experience a kind of ecstatic awakening. So through spiritual disciplines, we can also learn, if we're predisposed to, to bring this same transformational energy up out of the sacrum in a highly controlled way without actually needing to be at the end of life and yet cultivate certain experiences and certain changes in the body which allow those experiences then to be accessed. Mm. So this goes to 
I think, a very important field in occult and mystical consideration, Mm. that it's the body that needs to change in order to have certain capacities activated. And whether that happens through trauma or whether that happens through technique, Mm. that something needs to occur when we think about it as a kind of spiritual technology, mm-hmm. I often think about it as a second puberty. That there is similarly a radical change, particularly in glandular function, but also in other areas of the brain, that are just as remarkable as happened when we were 15 years old. Mm. And this is why the books of the dead are also the books of initiation. Right. The Egyptian Book of the Dead, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, are describing things that are experienced when one is liberated from the limits of the physical senses and can retain consciousness as we move into these non-ordinary states. And as you were saying, Deb, it may very well be that with the growing accessibility of psychedelics, individuals who are not predisposed to spiritual disciplines, and thank goodness are not in these traumatic circumstances, can begin to get glimpses of this inner place. And as we were saying earlier, afford themselves the transformations of attitude and the benefits of that in terms of the rest of their life journey, one of which is this triumph over Thanatos. Mm -hmm. And Freud said, and this is at the basis of all the analytic traditions, is that every form of neurotic suffering is in some way collapsed into the fear of death Mm. and that the goal is to be able to realign to love or eros there is love and death and i think while that may seem simplistic we are in this realm of very similar consideration And it's not a decision, but it's a lived discovery. It it's uh, it seems to me that we're talking about some of the very biggest things that we could be talking about. So. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's a way that I I feel a little speechless, uh, but but certainly it it in, it invites that embrace of love that you're talking about, Joseph. And uh, you know, I'm 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 struck by what what the after effects of of Jung's uh, near death experience were, and and in some in some ways I. I don't think it was a big surprise to him in some sense because oh. it 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 seems so in line with uh his interests in waking life throughout his whole life. Um by the way, there's been research done trying to figure out if there are any common elements be- among people who have NDEs and they could find none. So it's it's not that if you're a more spiritual person you're more likely to have one or anything like that. But here is Jung having this experience that, in in some sense, uh, is very aligned with his interests throughout his life. And then um, I'm thinking of his famous BBC interview that he did later after this, in which the interviewer says, Dr. Jung, do you believe in God? And he takes a minute and he says, I don't believe I know. Uh-huh. And I'm thinking, well, if you had an experience like that, of course you know. And 
And so let's take a moment and turn our attention to a dream. Our dreamer is a 29-year-old male who works as a project manager, and he has titled his dream, Trapped in the Company. I am the newest addition to a historic preservation crew, improving temples and schools of a bygone people and culture in the Sierra Nevada mountains. These spaces are empty to the naked eye. Each night, spirits and creatures come to haunt us, to harass and molest us. We are not welcome here. I am not directly bothered. However, as we make our deeper way into the Sierra, the nights grow more dangerous as we sleep at the job site. Some members of the outfit, more senior than me, abandon the job. They face ridicule from the other bosses who choose to continue onward. I'm scared and question my own allegiance to the company and why I'm even here at all as time goes on. A result of the nightly hauntings are the breakouts of severe acne on my colleagues' faces. Mm -hmm. They are bruised, irritated, and increasingly unrecognizable as each day passes. I ask why this is happening. I only receive cryptic responses. No one tells me exactly what is upset with us, exactly what it is we appear to be disturbing at a mm. profound level. I feel increasingly trapped, mm. a hostage of this company's message. Mission. No one will come clean about what we're doing here. Frustration and fear grow over the life of the dream to no resolve. And for context, he writes, I am increasingly frustrated by an ideology that has entered my workplace in the last three years. I feel an increasing expectation to perform in accordance with this new ideology, which I disagree with personally. The main feelings in the dream for him were being trapped and being denied the truth of the situation. And he adds a few associations. Contractor work he associates with animosity about the nature of being dispensable as a temporary employee, and excavation and renovation of something misunderstood. He associates with a disdain for the arrogance he perceives in those who think they know how to improve something that they have little or no experience with. Mm. Um, I have, I have, I have big reactions to this dream. <laughs> okay, go for it. Uh, so first of all, I think it's a pretty profound dream, and it strikes me that it's one of those dreams that's possibly for the collective and not just this individual. You know, there. Well, where to start? First of all, his comment about the kind of arrogance of people trying to. Um, fix something that's really ancient. So I, I kind of got that in the dream too. It's like, whoa, these are temples and you're, you're, you're desecrating them somehow, you know, and, yeah. and some, some element in the temple is, is responding to that. And in, in terms of ideology, which I think is everywhere in our culture right now, I think a lot of people are kind of mired in ideology. And the thing about it is when that happens to you, you usually don't see it. Because you, you think you're just right. And I mean, I'm saying that being totally aware that I could be trapped in an ideology that I don't see, right? I mean, I try to be vigilant about that, but it's very hard not to be. So um, I, I think that there's, you know, ideology of all kinds in our society right now really holding sway. And there's actually something about this dream that reminds me of many of the dreams in this book called The Third Reich of Dreams by... Uh, the name will come to me. Oh, um, Barat, B-E-R-A-D-T. So this, um, I think her first name was Charlotte Barat. Anyway, she was a journalist in Nazi Germany. And she was not a psychologist. She went around and she collected people's dreams, like during Nazification. It's a, mm. it's a really interesting book. It's very expensive now because it's out of print, but I've, I've read the whole thing. 
She doesn't interpret the dream psychologically, but there is this sense of kind of something stifling that almost like the psyche can't really, uh, can't give full expression to something. Something's being trapped and stuffed in, Be, you know, and the sort of sense you get from reading these dreams, because they're actually, most of them, horrid, like most of them are quite boring, actually. And, and you get the sense that what's, um, what, what was true then was that the imposition of uh, Nazi ideology was so stifling that it even stifled people's dreams. Mm. So there's a little there's a little sort of flavor of that in this dream. You know that something um something is really amiss and it seems to be amiss. I I'm going to um I I I I'm going to tend to see this the same way the dreamer sees it that it 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 tend I I believe this dream is commenting on an outer world experience of feeling um uh, uh, stifled by an ideology that the thing about ideology is it usually cuts us off from the past. If you think about major ideological movements like Maoism, for example, but really, or you know, the 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 ideology during the French Revolution, or you know, just it either connects you with a false past, like Nazism did. Or it cuts you off and renders uh, uh, sort of irrelevant, uh, you know, the, the real past. You know, you could think about people pulling down statues in that way too. So there's there's something. There is a past here. There's an there are ancient temples and schools, but mm -hmm. they're being improved. But something exactly. in something there doesn't like it. So I'll shut up. Right. right now I'm kind of rambling, <laughs> but that's how this dream right. hit me. I I, th um, I agree with you, Lisa, and I'm thinking about the paradox here of, uh, you know, the cognitive dissonance, rather, right yeah. in the initial setting of the dream. I'm the newest addition to a historic preservation crew, quote, improving, unquote, temples and schools of a bygone people and culture. Well, if you're a part of a historic preservation crew, your mission is to be attentive and devoted to what the intent of the bygone peoples and culture was. You don't improve it. You don't make modifications. And people on um, uh, archaeological digs use these tiny little brushes to brush off, uh, you know, sand or dirt so as not to damage in even the slightest way uh, an object or a new layer of, of the dig, uh, it, it is being preserved and honored. And that's not what's going on in this dream. And there it is right in the initial situation, uh, the psychic situation, which is, um, it's not historic preservation, it's alteration. And that is what ideology does. It tells us this is good or right or valuable, um, and it ain't necessarily so. It's what we want it to be with whatever kind of ego dominance is taking place on the part of a group or uh, creators of an ideology or a culture that, that there are uh, essential truths that must not be questioned. Mm -hmm. So. Uh I can really align with this possibility that the dream is a collective commentary, and I think it's, mm -hmm. it's remarkable when sometimes people dream on behalf of a larger issue. Um, just to open up another dimension of yes. it, I'm going to just assume that the dream in, in, in this past is purely intrapsychic, that there's something just going on on a personal level mm -hmm. for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they're going, he's going deeper into the Sierra Nevada mountains. And the deeper he goes, the more intense things become and the more haunted he mm. becomes. Mm. So hauntings in general and ghosts can be interpreted as complexes. 
there are this remnants of people that are no longer there, which is really exactly what a complex is. Um, we have um, thousands of memories of an individual person, let's say a, a, a father or a mother, and even if they are still biologically alive and we go off to college, live somewhere else, we are haunted by the internal mm -hmm. representations of those experiences. So, most importantly, that the complexes that are affecting the psyche are invisible. And therein lay the primary problem. Yeah. And I think the great venture of all forms of analysis, of Freudian, Jungian, Lacanian, is trying to make the invisible visible because we mm. are affected mm -hmm. by all kinds of memories and feelings, and more so when we can't get a glimpse of them. So we're beginning to see the effects of these unvisualized feeling states. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we know that they um, evoke this feeling of harassment. I'm not sure what he means by molestation. That has many different valences. Mm -hmm. And that the nightly hauntings are creating severe acne. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, for most of us, acne is part of puberty. That um, with this enormous upsurge of testosterone, mm -hmm. this overproduction of sebum in the skin and other things, produces this intense acne, and for this person, really bruising, um, swelling all over the face. But acne comes from the deeper layer of the skin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most people think it has something to do with keeping the face clean, but it's not. It's um, way down in the dermis. There's an overstimulation of the functioning of the skin, and things tr are trying to break out from the surface. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the, the invisible becoming visible. Yeah, that's, that's great, yeah. And, and it's difficult, and, and I think there is no lysis in the dream yet, that we're just in the beginning of a growing demand in the psyche to tolerate the tension of something that, that's trying to talk to this mm -hmm. person. And, um, and there's a decision there that, why am I staying on the mission? Yep. Why, why don't I just get the heck out of Dodge? And that, that's really great, Joseph. And I, you know, I, I like, I like your taking it to the personal realm. And I, I want to say too, maybe related is, you know, the other thing about acne is like you said, it's kind of associated with um, puberty. So, so is there, is there a little hearkening mm -hmm. back to adolescence here, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or an adolescent frame of mind, or d does it, does it speak to something that was true for the dreamer at that time of life? There's some, some things being kind of infantilized in some way or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking about the acne and the facial distortion as the price that persona has to pay. You know, that's the face we turn to the world, uh, you know, something that is pleasant and neutral and so on and so forth. And then all of a sudden um, that is being, uh, you know, demonstrably uh, flawed and, um, you know, announcing to the world, this is not okay. I think I also want to mention that, you know, I think what the, our dreamer is saying in the dream too is, um, being gaslighted, mm, yeah, uh, yeah, and and there's something where he says at the very end, um, you know, that he he's being denied the truth of the situation. Well, you know, uh, what's the truth? Uh, we mm -hmm. could go, we could go around and around and around on that. But um, there are a number of people in my life who feel coerced to remain silent or provide lip service uh, to a community or workplace uh, set of values that they may not agree with. 
And universally of these, the people that I know, and we're just talking a handful of people, so it's a big generalization to make, but uh, is the objection is there is no dialogue. We're not communicating about it. How do we talk about it rather than people feeling that there is an overlay of truth and rightness and justice and, you know, a bunch of other sort of virtuous seeming values uh, that, that are um, doctrinal in some situations. And what I would suggest is along those lines is this preservation of some ancient temples. <laughs> to me, it sounds like a religious conflict. And it's not uncommon, particularly mm. for young men who are in the midst of a sexual awakening, if you are part of a religious context that insists on purity or demonizes sexuality, it's a time of enormous conflict mm. as to whether or not uh, sexual experimentation is permitted or whether it's damned in, in terms that are very, very frightening. So I think there is, where I would be curious with this dreamer is, to go back to the early sexual conflicts, that when you began to wake to your own sexual dynamism, what kinds of thoughts, what kinds of religious beliefs, social beliefs, made your own sexuality seem like a dangerous creature that would come out at night and mm. harass and frighten? And, and I think possibly the naming is, it's your sexuality. That, that, that's the thing that mm -hmm. no one is saying. <laughs> and in many religious households, there is sadly a belief that if we keep children ignorant of sexuality, somehow that keeps sexuality away from them. So we don't talk about <laughs> sexuality or we don't talk about sexual identity in any form at all. And then what happens is sexuality then becomes a kind of unnamed and invisible tension that comes to visit and frighten. And it hasn't been named. So I, I would offer that as one possibility to the dreamer. I'm also aware that our dreamer is a project manager, and at, at the end, uh, he adds to his association's uh, contractor work. So that may be, you know, as a project manager, part of what he does. And um, so I'm interested in uh, what's a contractor, and what do you contract for? And in his dream, there are people um, who leave. Uh, and uh, the senior people are are disdainful than that. He says some members of the outfit abandon the job, and they face ridicule from the other bosses. Um, and then he says, I'm scared. I question my own allegiance to the company and why I'm even here at all. Uh, so it raises the question of what is our dreamer contracting for mm -hmm. uh, psychologically, symbolically? What's the deal? What's the deal? Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, workplaces have always had the ability to mandate certain things. Um, I'm old enough to remember people who worked for IBM back in the day. Mm -hmm. There was a dress code. A and uh, guys wore shirts and ties and jackets and women dressed a certain way. And if you were a woman back then, you had to, quote, dress for success in a skirted suit. And uh, the, what's the deal that undergirds mm. that deal that looks like it's all perfectly proper, perfectly nice, professional? Really? What's, what else is going on here? And what, what does an employee really contract for unconsciously? as well as doing the nine-to-five part of the job consciously. What part are we being asked to buy into? You've been listening to This Jungian Life, 
From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.